Now, in the construction business, and everybody knows this, and God talks about it in his word, foundation is important. No matter how good the materials are, the, the, the design of the building, no matter how nice, the, it all rests on the foundation. This particular uh, message is a foundational message, and it's kind of frustrating to me because by statistics, and certainly at this church, every Sunday, at least one-third of the body is not here. Everybody takes turns of coming to church. I realize there's all kinds of circumstances, but it, we average out. So in, in every message I preach, about one-third of our own people won't hear this message. Then when, they, when it's their turn to come to church, they, they don't have the foundation to be able to understand it. So I'm going to ask you, when you're not here, whoever you are, next Sunday, that you, through YouTube or whatever, you listen to it so that you can get the foundation to understand. Because I'm going to be talking, the name of this message today is Jesus Told Stories. And really, what it really needs to be, the, he spoke parables on purpose. And so we're going to be dealing with the parables, but I have to understand what you, make you to understand, or the Holy Spirit wants you to understand, as a reason why there was a particular point in Jesus' ministry where he stopped preaching sermons about the kingdom and he only spoke in parables. Would you say with me, that day? Say it again, that day. So we want to, to, to talk about the day that Jesus stopped preaching and he start telling stories, and a better word for that, of course, the Bible calls them parables. Uh, understanding these stories, and what I'm going to do to save time, and it's so important, I have a few words I'm going to preach in between, but I'm going to basically read this outline. You'll be able to hear it, you'll be able to see it, and I'm going to fill in the blanks. So understanding these stories is a crucial matter for any follower of Jesus today, I'm going to try to help you to grasp the meaning of the parables to help you receive help from these masterfully told stories by the Lord Jesus Christ, the master storyteller, but not a storyteller like once upon a time. If God says the same next week, I'm going to put on this foundation the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is the most misunderstood parable of all the 40 parables that Jesus taught. So you want to hear that. And again, uh, because of YouTube, because of radio and television, you don't want to miss that because a lot of people do good works that will have no eternal value by misunderstanding the parable of the Good Samaritan. So we're going to cover some of the most famous parables Jesus told, but just because these stories are familiar doesn't mean the true meanings are well known. In fact, I would venture to say that the parables of our Lord are not understood by most people because he told the parables so that they would not understand him. Jesus told these stories for the very purpose of hiding his truth. Now, would you say in a loud voice, I will be judged by the word of God, how much I understood them, but primarily how much that I obey them. In this day, many will say unto me, Jesus, did I not cast out devils? Did I not prophesy? Did I not lay hands on the sick? And he will say the most harsh words you will ever have out of his mouth, depart from me you workers of the iniquity who justified yourself and refused to do the will of the Father. There's another scripture that says, we are not the children of God if we do not do all the will of the Father. It's a scary thing. And so many people are so slack in obeying the word of God and they think, and I blame it on a lot of the, and, and listen, I'm not jealous, I'm not envious, and I'm not against them. But the mega churches who simply tell stories to entertain people and not ever warn them that they must repent of their wicked ways and they must 
be a, make themselves obedient to the word of God, there's going to be a terrible day on Judgment Day. I just spoke to a Catholic lady, an older woman, and uh, she was talking about, um, you, you know, uh, embracing her physical problems and so on so that she could have the crown in heaven. And I said, yeah, I said, uh, and I said lovingly to her, but I said, yeah, but let me explain to you. When we all get to heaven, because she said she was going to go see Jesus, I said, when we all get to heaven, we're not going to see Jesus like the little on the little shellac piece of pine, see that little calm, blue-eyed, curly brown head, Jesus petting the lamb. He's going to have fire in his eyes. He's going to have a sword coming out of his mouth. And that sword represents the word of God that we're going to individually by ourselves be justified or condemned by how much of the word of God did we actually do, not just because we said the name of Jesus. And she changed the subject. She didn't want to hear no more about that. I fear for people who think they're, they're safe, think they're saved, think they're Christians, and they know nothing about the word of God. And they turn around and with only their minds, they judge the scriptures and come out feeling good about themselves because they know, they know Jesus. It's going to be a shock to so many people. And again, can you imagine John the Baptist baptizing people who believed in Jesus and when the most highly religious people in the world went to get it, he said, get out this water, you're a bunch of snakes. Your grandma had a rattle this big. Your grandpa had fangs that big. You get in this water, I'm getting out. That was a picture of what's going to happen. You need to thank God you're in the church that doesn't think you're good. Understand that? There's none good. None good. And we, we must stay in a state of repentance. I'm telling you what, 1 John 1, 9, I wear it out all day long. You know why? Just my mind alone. Just my resentment, my worry, my anxiety, my frustration, thinking about my enemies, thinking about all kinds of stuff, thinking of, uh, you, you know, I, I tell you what, you know what, because I don't know the moment that he's going to blow that horn and I'm going to have to explain myself. But he's faithful to forgive if we're faithful to ask for forgiveness and repent. Yeah. Yeah. So most people think Jesus told stories to make everything clear. And no, he told stories because he was hiding kingdom principles from those who had rejected him. He didn't want them to understand. A story without an explanation is a riddle that can't be solved. But for those who believe in Jesus Christ, the stories illustrate powerful divine truth. Now, Wayne Wiggins is a friend of mine. I lean on Wayne in, in, in the ministry at this church. He's been with me here a long, long, long time. Now, he is sitting with his wife and his daughter at 3600 Manhattan at the 1030 service. That is a truth. But there's a greater truth. He and his family are really seating in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, they're already victorious. They're already uh, overcomers. And so are you, of course. So we can understand life by natural truth or we can understand life by spiritual truth. I have asked people over and over again, I know you read your Bible, but don't read your Bible unless you have asked the Holy Spirit to let you read it in your spirit and get the truth that's hidden in what anybody can read, like a history book of what the Jews did or what Jesus did. Too many Christians read the Bible. They know what it says, but they, they're on the wrong parallel. They're not in the spirit. They're not receiving what is hidden in those words. And Jesus purposely spoke parables to hide it from those who did not want his will. Next week, if God says the same, I'm going to preach the parable of the Good Samaritan 
and we're going to find out some truths. It's the most misunderstood parable that ever was. And then we're going to talk about other ones. So we're going to look at the parables together in this teaching series. Uh, the title, Jesus Told Stories. Our purpose is unlocking the parables of Jesus. This is a fundamental and indispensable truth concerning our salvation in the kingdom. He was teaching kingdom truths where people heard what he said in the story and they never understood what he was really trying to say. Now, let me tell you why I'm a little enraged, okay? Uh, there have never been more Bible schools. Churches now all over the world have their own Bible schools. We have one in Africa uh, and in seminaries. But what they do, they read, they, they, the professors in the seminaries are teaching young preacher, preachers now. And this is what's happening in all of the mega churches. They're making them be storytellers. They're telling people, people have short attention spans. That's why you can't even say, okay, you just hit K or you just hit a heart or something. You know, we, we, we don't have time. The commercials seem too long on the television. We're all in a hurry and, and, and they, we're just, we're just minimizing everything. So they said, why don't you imitate Jesus? He told stories to entertain the people so that they would listen to him. And they are teaching young preachers, don't make long sermons. Tell 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and so the mega churches, the people love to hear the stories with no convicting word whatsoever. And I do not want that in this church or any of the churches that we are associated with. We want the word that breaks your heart. We want a broken and contrite spirit. We don't want sacrificing our time to come to church, uh, you know, uh, the, thinking the whole time while the guy's teaching where we're going to have lunch after. I want you to know the word ought to shake you to your foundation. If it doesn't, you're listening to it with your mind. Teaching about the parables is really important. There's actually a parable that Jesus told during the middle of his Passion Week that ignited the final fire, or I should say the fire that was already going, which was rejection from the Pharisees. They were the major people who knew the scriptures, knew the prophets, and they couldn't recognize him standing before them. Chapter 11 of John ends with the leaders of Israel wanting to seize him. Then they wanted, it's like Trump. They, 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 they want to put him in jail. Okay. They, you know, there's no fair. They just hate, 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 hate him. They just want him. Now, I know he's not Mr. Wonderful, but I'm going to tell you it's an example. Jesus Christ was so hated, they wanted him dead. Then we move to the middle of the week and he tells a parable recorded in Mark 12. The end of the parable says the same thing. They were looking for a way to seize him, imprison him, lock him up, shut his mouth, kill him. It's really a combination of the raising of Lazarus and the telling of the parable that pre precipitated the human activity that led to his cruel. Ex in other words, the parables were a mark in history. Say with me again, that day. Say it aloud, that day. Put your finger on it. That's the day that Jesus' ministry radically changed forever on that day because the religious people rejected him. And he came and they couldn't, they didn't want to hear what he said. And he was a threat to them because of their organized religion. Now, people don't understand the parables. There's a lot of very wrong thinking about the parables. There's a very high degree, as I said, about the improper preaching of parables. Uh, the, uh, the parables play a critical role in the rejection of Jesus Christ right up to the very final week of his life. The parables of Jesus is about 40 of them. I don't know the exact name, but I counted at least 40. The parables are only in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and very, very amazing, not one parable is in the book of John. 
In Matthew 13, verses 1 through 3, the first two words are important. That day, say it to me again, that day. This day is a day in which a dramatic transformation takes place in the teaching of Jesus. This is the day an epic shift happened in his ministry. This is an ominous day in every sense because it shows the difference between condemnation and justification, and it happened on a day. We celebrate our birthday. We're going to celebrate Memorial Day. Yesterday, we celebrated uh, two of our grand, great-grandchildren's birthdays. We, we remember the day we got married. We remember our anniversary day. We remember the day we graduated. We remember our, our first date day. We, we remember the day your mama died. Uh, you know, a day. And Dan already said, today is the day of salvation. If you listen to me and you've never repented and you, you've never asked Jesus Christ to forgive your unrighteousness, beg him right now to be your Lord and Savior and you'll remember the day that you accepted Jesus Christ for the rest of your life. A day is important and that was a day that changed Jesus Christ's ministry forever. And it was the day between condemnation and justification. We need to pay attention to it. The events that happened that day would be enough, but there's a turning point in the entire ministry of Jesus on that one day. It happens to be on the Sabbath day. You cannot be a Jew without cherishing the Sabbath. They, are, they, 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 they honor the Sabbath to this day, not only in Israel, but in Jews all over the world. It was an important day. But the Sabbath was responsible for the change in Jesus' ministry that happened on that day. We remember Jesus was in Galilee backing up about a year into his death. So we're really looking, we're going to be looking at about a two-year span of Jesus' ministry on earth. In Matthew 13, 1 through 2, that day Jesus went out. Isn't it interesting? That day Jesus went out of the house sitting by the Lake of Galilee. A large crowd had already gathered, which was what happened every time he went to speak. So he got into a boat and he sat down. And the whole crowd was standing on the beach. He did this because it allowed him to move away from the crowd of people, be separated a little bit. But also he used it because they didn't have sound systems and he used the, wa the water as a microphone to move it to the thousands that were listening to him as he did in the valley when he, when he spoke the, the great uh, sermon of the mount. And he allowed it. Uh, Elaine and I, and some of you had, were in Israel, and, and I, I was on the shore of Galilee. We were on the, Gal the, the Sea of Galilee, and we were where Jesus spoke the, the Sermon on the Mount, and we were there where he cast out the demons into the pigs. We were there. It, it's an important thing that happened. But we want to realize that when he's speaking in verse 3, Jesus spoke many things to them. How? In sermons, no. In parables, on this day and from that day, on wherever he taught in public, he only spoke in parables. Let me tell you, on that day, that day was the day that he never spoke a sermon again. He only spoke in parables. There are no parables in the Sermon on the Mount which is the most extensive illustration of his sermons. There is an illustration at the end about the flood, the houses built on, on, uh, on sinking sand and, or, or rock, and, but there is no parable. But from here on, Jesus always speaks in parables. Do you think my point is that Jesus only spoke in parables? If you did not know, Jesus from then on only spoke in parables. And we want to know why he only spoke in parables from that day on. So, Brother Mike, what is a parable? Well, I knew you were going to ask that. So it's a word picture as an elongated simile or metaphor. 
A parable can be relatively short or it can get relatively long. The word para, P-A-R, means alongside. So Jesus would speak in parables laying two truths side by side like a, ra uh, a, a railroad track. Now, here I go again. I know I, I, my world pretty much is ministering to ministers, not because I'm so wonderful. It's just my position because I didn't seek them. They come to me. But I know a lot of times I have to tell them, would you please tell me what you read in the Bible that causes you to want to make that particular decision? Are you leaning to your understanding by reading a verse and without revelation from the Holy Ghost to tell you really what you should do. Because if you think with your mind, you're going to make plans based on coins, clocks, calendars, and circumstances, and you're going to do works, and one day on that day, you're going to say, did I not cast out devils and build a large church in your name? And you're going to depart me from me. You never did. You are a worker of iniquity. You did what you wanted to do. You lean to your own understanding. You then have a clue what I wanted you to do. And you did what you did in my name, but you didn't do what I wanted you to do. It's a terrifying thing. So I invented this principle and I tell him, look, before you go looking for a sermon or before you go looking for uh, some some um, confirmation to what you want to do, would you please ask the Holy Spirit, the teacher and the rep, that as you read, you don't lean to your understanding and read his story. That's where we get history. His story where, and that that even the, the unbelievers read the Bible and think it doesn't make sense, and, and it can, can uh, it, 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 you know, it speaks against itself and all this conflicts itself. Why don't you get, read the word and get the light that comes out of it that is greater so that you have a truth that's supernatural knowledge rather than natural book learning understanding. There's two different things. That's why theologians, the, Logan's preaching a great sermon. Uh, you may might as well talk about in 1492, Columbus said that, I mean, it's a, it's a history fact, but it has no life in it. <laughs> now, we might remember in school finding out the word parabola. I remember uh, when I was going to Berman High School and they started talking about a parabola. I had never, I, nobody on the West Bank of New Orleans knew what a parabola was. And I found out a parabola, again, are two curved lines that never, ever intersect in an infinity. They never, ever, both of them are true, but one's a greater truth than the other truth, but they never, ever meet. So, Revelation from the Holy Ghost and understanding from the natural mind never, ever intersect. So you have to have knowledge from on high or you lean to your own understanding. And you can say, Lord, Lord, but you can never have eternal confirmation of a reward because you only did what you thought would work. When we talk about, I'm leaking out, but when we talk about uh, the Good Samaritan, you have the Lions Club, you have, uh, you have uh, human uh, Homes for Humanity, you have all these people who use that same parable and they feel good about doing good and they want everybody to know they're good and they tell you about all the good that they do and they use that and it ain't about that. So they use a scripture for the foundation of what they do and miss, miss, because Jesus spoke in parables. They don't want his lordship. They don't want to obey him. They don't want him to be their righteousness, him to be their goodness. They want it for themselves, their Pharisees.
let me read it again. We might remember finding out about a parabola. Two curved lines that marry each other perfectly, but they never intersect. That's a parable. Jesus began that day to speak in parables. The people that were listening to his words in their mind and the people who heard him in the spirit. Two different truths. Up to this time, Jesus had basically drawn from the Old Testament, trying to get them to, the, their whole thing was the knowledge of the scripture. So he used the knowledge of the scripture, but they never recognized the knowledge himself. They knew the word, but not the word. Because they only saw with their eyes and their ears, but not their spirit. And they did not want him to be their righteousness. And they did not want his will on earth. So he had focused on doctrines and theological truths. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus becomes the most famous storytelling that ever was. And again, what gets me, because I read these things, I research these things, theologians are teaching these young preachers to get the attention of the new crowd now and tell them stories for about 10 or 15 minutes and just entertain them. So now we got thousands of people coming to church missing Jesus, certainly missing the Holy Spirit, and they have no clue of the convicting word of God. So therefore, they have no reason to repent, and they leave feeling good because they went to church. And it's the same thing the Pharisees had the Messiah himself, the Lamb of God himself, the Word of God himself, the sword of the Spirit right there, and they couldn't recognize him. Now, would you say with, raise your hand, say, in Jesus' name, I accept parables or divine condemnation. Now, this all gets started on when? The Sabbath day, the heart of being a Jew. God's law for the Sabbath is this, don't work. What's God's law for the Sabbath? Don't work. What did he say about the Sabbath? Don't work. I was amazed years ago when I found out God had one law, don't work. The Jews had a thousand, a thousand rules. God has one, they got a thousand. And that one is hard enough to keep, let alone a thousand. The Sabbath becomes a nightmare to the Jewish people. And it was their religious, their religious leaders that, that invented it. That was the burden, that was the bondage that he came to rest from. So somebody says, I'm a saboteurian. Well, what do you mean by that? I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't go there, and I don't say this, and I don't eat that. I don't do this, and I don't do that. They have the church of the be-knows. They'll be-know this, they'll be-know that, they'll be-know this. God has a certain, uh, one command, be. What do you mean, be? Be in me, because I am. Just be in me, and you're safe. Now, what's interesting is he says you have to work, labor to get into the rest. He is the rest. He is the Sabbath. He said, labor, quit trying to be righteous and come to me and rest and you will be righteous. He came to rescue us from our need to be righteous and take a bow for it. We all understand the foolishness of the history of Israel. After they were given the law of God, they virtually disobeyed it for centuries. They did not obey the Sabbath. Centuries. They did whatever they needed to do for their own sake on the Sabbath day, and the only rule of the Sabbath day was don't work. But they did everything they can. Why? In the history, it says they did their fields, they, they did their, their herds with their animals to make money on the Sabbath. No. 
I grew up on the West Bank of New Orleans as a child. There were no stores open. You couldn't go to a car lot. You could nobody worked on a Sunday, and we were Catholics. What? The Jews, on the other hand, celebrated the Sabbath, but they worked to get money. Now remember, he drew the line. You either are doing it under mammon or you're doing it under Christ. So they celebrated that day by transgressing the law. So what happens is they broke the Sabbath day and the Sabbath year. They broke the Sabbath all the time. Why? For money, for apostasy and idolatry, because they didn't use the Sabbath to worship God. They used it for mammon and for their own appetites. And they became apathetic and indifferent, and they violated the Sabbath. So now, what happens here? Uh, eventually, the rabbis started becoming concerned about the violations of the Sabbath. After hundreds of years, uh, the rabbis they said, we, so they got some ham sandwiches in a car, and they had a round table, and they all got together. What are we going to do about this? God said, to celebrate the Sabbath, but nobody celebrates the Sabbath. So they got together, and again, not by revelation of the Spirit, but a natural man, how are we going to get the church together? And they said, i tell you what to do. We'll tell them, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you can't do this. And they wound up with a thousand laws that made the Sabbath day the most miserable experience to every Jew that ever lived and still lives. No. So eventually the rabbis started becoming concerned about the violation of the Sabbath, so they wanted to protect the Sabbath in order to sort of kind of recover the Sabbath and insulate the Sabbath against such violations. They covered the Sabbath in endless rules. <laughs> they couldn't just leave it to worship God Almighty or delight in God, take a day off, put your feet up. Don't work because people didn't respond to that. So they now they took control. Does anybody understand that in every family, that's at least one witch? Understand that? In every office, there's at least one witch. There's somebody that invents rules. Today, they call them Karens. They, 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 they do everything they can to control other people. So they're the only one that doesn't keep the rule, but they put everybody else, everybody else, they enforcing everybody else, dominating everybody else because they have to maintain control. That's who the Jews were, the Pharisees. They controlled a nation by enforcing rules. Now watch, that they could never keep themselves. This is why Jesus says, why do you judge other people for doing what they're doing when you can't do it yourself? Are we still here? They just couldn't leave it to worship God Almighty or delight in God. So they created a massive complex of Sabbath laws. By Jesus' time on the scene, because this is hundreds of years later, in the most dreaded day of the week is the Sabbath. Every way you could look at it, it was miserable. It's not a day off. It's a day of all kinds of ridiculous encumbrances and burdens and rules and laws. The pendulum has swung from complete abandonment of the Sabbath to this legalistic keep the law, don't do this, you must do that. In fact, the whole Jewish righteousness legal system found, found a kind of a symbol, the Sabbath day. Nobody could keep the Sabbath day, but everybody was bound by the Sabbath day. They all had a law that they could not keep. Understand Jesus loved the Sabbath. He loved the Sabbath day. That became another way that he attacked their self-righteous legalistic system. Okay, say that day. That day is the Sabbath day. 
Now, we have to pay attention, Jack, because in Matthew chapter 12, we find Jesus on the Sabbath day, that day, walking through the grain fields. He wasn't supposed to be walking through anywhere. He wasn't supposed to be walking according to the law. But he was, here's Jesus walking, knowing the Jews are watching him. You know what he did? He leads all his men into the grain field because they were hungry, and they start picking grain, which you're not supposed to harvest on the Sabbath day. So he's walking, Jesus himself, when he shouldn't be walking, and he's eating grain and allowing his other people to eat grain, and he's driving the, the, the Pharisees up a tree. The Pharisees see it in verse 2, and they say, Your disciples do what is not lawful on the Sabbath. Now, that's not by any Old Testament law. It's not by any divine uh, command or prescription. It's purely and simple. Jesus was breaking their law, not God's law. So Jesus responds, and I love this. If you don't hear anything else I say, Jesus responds by telling them about an instance in the Old Testament. He says, well, let me ask you about David, your prophet David. Did he not go into the temple itself, bring all of his men in there, and eat the consecrated bread? And you talking about me eating a handful of wheat? And then you add to it, verse 8, Jesus says something that drives them absolutely crazy. He says, don't tell me what to do on the Sabbath. The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. I'll decide what to do on the Sabbath because I am the Sabbath. And I keep the law because I am the rest. And anybody who comes to me has labored to come into the rest where they can rest for eternity in me. I am the Sabbath. And you're trying to tell me what I can do and can't do on the Sabbath? Okay. Now, everybody say, that day. That was the day that changed history forever and changed the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So from there, after breaking... Uh, after breakfasting, by walking through the fields and plucking grain, Jesus went into the synagogue where there was a man with a withered hand. Everybody put your hand up and do this. Now look at that hand. Move your fingers. The withered hand. Now look, he leaves the Pharisees who say he's breaking the fact. So he goes immediately to the temple and he sees a man with a withered hand. One, two, Three, four, five. The five-fold ministry had withered for hundreds of years. He walks into the temple and he sees a man with a withered hand. And he restores the ministry back to the five-fold ministry in the presence on the Sabbath day. That day, he restored the ministry back to what God wanted it to be. But they, they got mad. He went from a thousand laws that were miserable to five ministries to set captives free and deliver them. So Jesus says, stretch out your hand. The man stretch out the hand and he restores the ministry. But they just see a man. And they go crazy. You are healing a man on the Sabbath day? No. Of all the days it should have been on the Sabbath day. So these blind guides cannot see for a second. On that day, he's restoring ministry back to the integrity that it should be. Give him a shout in his house. And of course, in their system, they accuse him. And what do they do? And Jesus says, you blind gods, if you had a sheep and it fell into a ditch, it was going to die on the Sabbath. You hypocrites, wouldn't you go get? Is that, it's not this man. But again, they only saw a man with a withered hand who got healed. They had no idea 
of the divine spiritual implication and revelation and the, mat, the fact that the ministry had been restored. So how do they respond? Destroy him. Kill him for violating their ridiculous Sabbath rules. Yes, because this was a symbolic of Jesus' assault on their self-righteousness. They wanted to destroy him. Jesus loved the Sabbath, the rest, because that was him. But he hated the Sabbath that the Jews had. And he did everything to mock them in their love of the Sabbath, the bondage of men. On the same day in verse 22, a demon possessed men. On the same day, what day? On that day. What day? On that day. On that day, he changed his ministry forever. On that day, he restored the ministry. On that day, he mocked the Pharisees and their laws and their bondage. On that day, he immediately sees a demon-possessed man, blind and mute. Watch. He immediately sees a man, not the man with the withered hand, a man that couldn't see nor hear. What does he represent? The Jewish nation that had eyes but couldn't see, had ears but couldn't hear. And he delivers the guy. What day did he do it on? That day. And they look at him and they go, you cast out devils by the power of Satan himself. They couldn't have been more wrong. So two years into his ministry, in the final conclusion, after he had cast out devils, healed the sick, raised the dead, walked on water, fed the thousands, yeah. capsized a boat with the fish that came in, everything that he did, healed a man, all the miracles he did, and their, their final conclusion was he's doing it by the power of hell. Yeah. You know what I say to somebody who can't see or hear God's truth? You're hopeless. You're hopeless because you're a blasphemer. The nastiest prostitute, the, 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 the worst heroin addict, the worst murderer, the worst thief, is really better off than blasphemers. Blasphemers have no hope. They can never repent. Sinners have every opportunity in the world to repent at any moment. You know you have never create, done the unpardonable sin because you're always worried about it. People with a stone heart they have no chance of repentance because they never believe they're wrong. Because they believe everything that's good. He says, there'll come a time where they'll make evil of good. And good and evil trade places. And they will accuse you of what they are guilty of. In verse 3, he says... Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven by people, but not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's why they make a mistake. Okay. You can talk about Mike Mele, call me names, even call my ministry names if you want. But the moment you make the Holy Spirit's good, an act that you attack, you have crossed a line that you can never cross back on. I have had a lot, a lot of people turn against me and a lot of people on Facebook and YouTube and call in from the radio and the television and so on. You know, you can say anything I want about it. I know I make mistakes. I say things backwards. I'm skinny. I'm bald headed. I'm an old man. Uh, yeah, I talk like I'm from hours years. You go get right ahead. Yeah, you can do that. And, and, you know, and, and, and I, I don't even need to forgive you. I, that's just people criticizing somebody. But the moment you say this ministry, 
Now, most of those people, let me help you, they're dead. And they died. I even went to the hospital a couple of times to pray for them, and it was sneering at me when I was praying for them. And I want you to know, they died not being able to repent. And Jack, when it's over, it's over. Jesus reacted or responded to being rejected. Jerusalem, what I wanted to do for you, but you would not. And from that day, what day was that? That day, he said, okay, I'm going to give you divine condemnation. I'm going to speak. The word of God is going to speak to you. And you're going to hear what you want to hear and see what you want to see and conclude what you want to conclude. And from now on, I'll never speak a word of the kingdom to you again. You have sealed your fate. Uh, and he only spoke to everybody other than his disciples in parables, telling them stories that they would go down the tangent trying to figure it out. Let me read it again. Verse 3, therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven, people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. When someone blasphemes the Holy Spirit by saying that which he has done through the Son of God is from hell, that person is beyond the point of salvation. Well, that scares the hell out of me. Good. Good. If anyone speaks a word against the Son of Man, you can speak against the word against him, his humanness. Uh, you can talk about uh, he was ugly, he was this, he was that. You can do that. And again, the Holy Spirit might give you an opportunity to repent. That could be forgiven if repented of, if repented of. But your conclusion that the spirit, that the evil spirit has done, what the spirit has done it was from hell, you will never be forgiven. Now, why is that? Well, because they, they sear their heart. They don't believe they're wrong. Divine condemnation in verse 37. Jesus says, by your words, you will be justified. On the other hand, by your words, you will be condemned. Divine condemnation fell on this Sabbath day. Towards the end of the second year of our Lord's ministry, it was divine condemnation. In other words, those that had ears to hear, it was divine justification. Those that refused to hear, it was divine condemnation because in God's justice, they had to be judged by the word that they heard that they would not do. So Jesus spoke to them truths, but it was earthly truths that they didn't want to hear. And to his disciples or those who believed in him, in his lordship, he spoke the truth to them, kingdom truths. This is why I've said for years, because I, you know, I listen to what other preachers are preaching. On every Sunday, people get up and they preach the gospel out of the Bible, but not the gospel Jesus preached, which is the kingdom. You understand the difference? If you never hear what the kingdom commands are or what the word is, how are you going to base something that you're ignorant of? So if you're in a church that preaches the kingdom, now here's the difference. You don't have 7,000 people here. Because a natural man doesn't want that much of God to obey. Now, let me, let me say something in a very strong manner. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm, the Bible says, with words you offend many. I don't, I don't want to offend. I'm going to tell you. If he says, on that day, many will say to me, I prophesied in your name. I went to church. I gave an offer and I cast out devils. I went to the hospital. I anointed people with oil. He said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because you did what you wanted to do, but you didn't do what I wanted you to do. You didn't even know what I wanted you to do. 
Now, for all the people who are not here, the one third every Sunday, I know things happen, cars, children get sick, things happen. But when you have your rules and regulations on why you don't have to be committed to a church, I can go across the street and bring you with me right now at Walmart and I'll have at least five or six people tell me when I invite them to church why they don't go to church. Well, Pharisee, when you have your rule book and you, you, you know he says, do not forsake assembling yourself together in a church on the Sabbath day and you got your own rule book, you're going to answer for that. Uh, and you sing your little parables to yourself and you got 99 reasons why you don't have to part of your church. Oh, well, everybody's, you know, I, you know, everybody, I, I, you know, iniquity. And this is what he called them. You workers of iniquity, depart from me. You had your own religion. You never were in the kingdom. He clearly says in Matthew 7, 23, many will say to me on that day, didn't we sit, prophesy in your name, cast out demons? Yeah, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. The day wasn't even over at this point when we picked up the story in Mark at this particular point, after the incredible conflict around the synagogue, Jesus gets in a boat with his disciples and he goes across the north shore to the Sea of Galilee. And he brings them to the shore and a maniac comes. Now remember this maniac that he cast the, the demons into a pig and they all drowned. There are going to be a lot of people that are cast out into the sea of never, never again because divine massive power happens and that's why that demoniac was there. And the thing is, he heard and he saw and he was delivered and the masses of Pharisees didn't have a clue. The Pharisees' verdict in that was he does this by the power of hell. It has to be hell because only hell would attack our, relish, our, our righteous uh, organization of, the, of, the, of it. You see, they had, it had to be hell because we're right. This is why they rejected Christ. This is why the parables that we're going to be studying. We turn to Mark 4 to see what happened that day. It was a dramatic in the ministry of Lord Jesus, Mark 4, 33. With many parables, Jesus was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it or wanted to hear it. But to them, he spoke without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his disciples. Now, that was the first time that Jesus, that ominous dark day, that he incredibly changes his ministry forever. And why the change? Why does Jesus now give illustrations in stories instead of preaching sermons? In Matthew 13, 10, and this is so sweet. The disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables, but to us you don't? That's the question. Why are you doing this, Lord? Listen to Jesus' answer in verse 11. To you, it's been given the grace and the mercy by the Father to hear the words of the kingdom, but to everybody else, not. Right now, you need to throw your hands up and say, Lord, thank you, Jesus Christ, that I have the ears to hear and eyes to see the kingdom. You wonder why your sister-in-law is always mocking you because you go to church. Because to you, you've been given the grace and mercy to hear the Holy Spirit, but not her. 
and you can pray for her and preach to your blue in the face, she doesn't hear or see what you see. He says, I speak in parables so that they cannot understand. This is Jesus Christ saying this. That has not been given to them to understand it by my father. If I continue speaking clear church, me as a savior and deliverer and a healer, I'd have to heal them. This is in your Bible. This is your Jesus who said that. So I'm not going to give them clear understanding because Father doesn't have their name on the list in the book of life. Because they have rejected it from the beginning. But to you that have been in the grace, this is music to your ears. Matthew 13, 11 through 17. In them, the prophecy, now understand, the people didn't know the prophets, but these Pharisees knew all the books of the law. They quoted them from birth. They knew them by heart. So he says, in further condemnation, to in them, this prophecy, who's them? Those that cannot hear and see, the prophecy of Isaiah, which they should have had a clue of because they knew it and could quote it, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will never, ever understand. You will see with never seeing. You will hear but never because these people's heart has grown callous, hardened, and they purposely close their eyes from saving the truth. We all know people that ain't nothing. You hit them in the head with a brick. They are not going to hear the gospel. Now, is that because we want them all to go to hell? No, we want all of them to come to the Lord Jesus. But I'm, what I want to tell you, it makes the fact that you hear it, why do you hear it? Is because God chose you out of billions of people that ought to break your heart that he loved you so much. Who is he that gave you the opportunity to hear the gospel and love it? Uh, yeah. And countless billions won't receive it. And if they just didn't receive it, that's one thing. But when they despise it, otherwise they might See with their eyes, this is Jesus talking, and hear with their ears, and understand with their minds and hearts, and turn, and I would have to heal them. But blessed be your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because you hear. For truly, I tell you, Many of those Jewish prophets for hundreds of years would have loved to have heard and seen the words of the Savior, the Messiah, but they did not. But you get the opportunity. Put your hand on your eyes and say, Lord, thank you that I'm able to see in my spirit. And Father, thank you on my ears that I'm able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and I'm able to have revelation from you. I thank you, Lord. So we must know why Jesus taught in parables only. It was divine judgment. He was, it was judgment on willful, hard-hearted, unbelief, and rejection of who Jesus really was. Now think about all of the politicians all of the religious leaders in the Methodist Church, in the Catholic Church, in the Lutheran Church that are ordaining homosexuals, putting lesbian women in a pulpit, uh, that are standing in line trying to fight to kill babies all the way now up to birth. A new law coming up, you, they, they can allow the baby to be uh, almost out of the vaginal canal and they take a scissors and stick it in the brain and kill it so it was born dead. And they think that's birth control. Blind guides 
that blaspheme the loving kindness of God who made a man and a woman and you come up and you got a better idea and you want me to call them they and he and share a bath with them? Hell no. Absolutely not. But whoever has to him shall more be given. Come on, say, you pour it on, Lord. Drown me in revelation. And he will have an abundance. That is, you, his disciples. But whoever doesn't have, doesn't have a clue, even a little bit that he learned in the Bible school uh, will be taken from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. This is divine judgment. Now, look, I have preached Romans 128 more than any other scripture. And I've told you, you do not want God to take the light out of your life. You don't want that. The picture of the Israel is they were sitting in darkness, believing they were in the light. Romans 128 says, since they would not worship God, relate to God, submit to themselves to God as he was, though they knew God, he turned the light off, gave them a depraved mind that they think homosexually is God's mistake, that babies don't have to live, that a woman can call herself a woman and a mother and, and kill her own baby, that, that, that you can have homosexuals denying God in the pulpit, you can have transvestites in the kindergarten, you can do all of this blasphemous kind of stuff, mock, mock the Bible, the Ten Commandments, and think you're getting away from it, with a deprived mind to do things that should never have been done. Uh -huh. I want us to stand right now. I would like for you to join with me with kind of a brokenness. I'm overwhelmed that God will give me, Mike and Elaine, opportunity to not only know him, be forgiven by him, restored by him, gifted by him, anointed by him to touch his word for his bride. And I'm asking God for deeper and deeper revelation because if we cherish the revelation that we've been singled out of the whole faith of the earth instead of proud, humbled, and broken, that why me, Lord, but thank God, Lord, that he will give us more and more revelation and we'll move into a great revival. Raise your hand and begin to thank God. I thank you, Lord. I bless you, God. It's overwhelming, God. It's humbling that we who know we're not really good, we have bad moments, God. We resent people. We're prejudiced. We, we, we don't tell all the truth, God. Uh, we, there's a lot of things about us. We're envious. We're jealous, God. We're covetousness. We're competitive, God. We're everything we shouldn't be. But by your word, we're cleansed. And Father, you have hid us already in Christ. We're already victorious. We're already overcomers. We're in heavenly places, God. Father, help us not to try to love you in our mind. Help us worship you in spirit and in truth, God. We don't want to be religious. We don't want to justify ourselves. We don't, we don't want to make excuses. God, we want to enter your, your presence with joy in our heart. We thank you, God. Begin to shout him and love him and speak in tongues. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you were encouraged and blessed by the word. And if you'd like to partner with us at White Dove, I want to share a couple of ways that you can give to this ministry. First, you can text the letters WDF to 45777, or you can go to our website at whitedove.org. Thanks again, and God bless.